Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, as you've likely noticed by now from the announcements, um, there will not be a class on Friday. There will also not be a class on Monday. Um, I, I can't uh, be around to, to give either one. So instead, what I've done is decided to just finish up my previous lecture here, uh, and that'll be for you to watch sometime, whenever, over the weekend. And then Wednesday, I will finish up the learning chapter in time for here, So this should work out perfectly fine. All right, so let's magic back to where we were. There we go. All right, cool. So we were on, yeah, this slide, slide nine. We were talking about operant conditioning. So to remind you again, operant conditioning is um, a term that's used when we're talking about the way that the consequences of some action affect the future likelihood of that action being repeated in the same kind of context. Okay, so again, very basic idea. You're in some situation, uh, you choose to behave in a certain way, and either good things or bad things result. Uh, if a good thing results, you're more likely to repeat that. If a bad thing results, you're less likely to repeat that behavior. Now, when we got to slide nine, we were getting a little bit more specific about good thing and bad thing, um, and you know, both to give you some terminology, but also to, to point out some important reasons why we're being as picky as we are, so to speak. So, just to remind you where our head was, we were talking about, we can kind of think of it as extinction by itself for a second, we'll come back to extinction, but we were saying there's really two things, two ways, uh, two outcomes, let me say, that will reinforce a behavior. By reinforce, we mean it will make it more likely to occur again in the future when you're in that situation. And those two things relate to either something good happening as a result of your behavior or something bad disappearing as a result of your behavior. So in either cases, you can think, whoa, that's positive, right? That's, that's, you ended up in a better state than you started. And that's true. But we do want to make this distinction between the ways that can happen because we sometimes see different learning patterns depending on whether you add something good to somebody's situation or remove something negative. So if we add something good we call it positive reinforcement. If we remove something negative we call it negative reinforcement. I gave you the umbrella example. I also gave you the yelling at your little brother or sister and he goes away and stops bugging you. Well, that's the removal of something negative. So that behavior of yelling at them um, resulted in the removal of something negative. That's going to make it more likely that you'll yell at them in the future. Okay? So negative reinforcement. Tricky term. We've subtracted something negative, and that reinforces the behavior. Makes it more likely to occur. Okay. We got into these second ones, punishment and response costs. And I think these are an easier tool to explain to you why we do need this subtle distinction a little bit. Punishment is literally you do something and something very bad happens to you. So you you get something bad. Um, and, and so if you do something and, and you get something bad, well that's going to make you less likely to want to do that in the future. right? So this will reduce the likelihood of you repeating that behavior. Response cost is you do something, and as a result of that, you lose something good. You lose something you want to have. Okay. Again, both of those are like, well, yeah, so you do something, something bad happens, so, or there's a negative result. Yes, but the, this is subtly different, and the best example really is with respect to child rearing. And I kind of gave you a little bit of that, but let me be a little more clear. Let's imagine you are a child, and you do something you're not supposed to do. Um, let's say you're using bad words in front of guests, okay? Or using bad words at all. You really shouldn't use them at all. But if, if you say something you shouldn't, shouldn't say in front of a guest, the natural reaction of a parent is to get angry and to resort to punishment. That is, they might look at you and say, I've told you, you know, so many times not to do that. It makes me really angry. You're embarrassing us. You're blah, 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 blah. So they're introducing all this negativity into your world uh, by yelling at you and, and you know, uh, making you feel stupid and embarrassed in front of other people. Um, and what is the result of that? So yes, it may make you less likely to repeat it, 
but it also makes you feel like crap. And it's also a very aggressive kind of situation that could be associated with fear, right? When you have your parent yelling at you and angry at you and saying things and uh, it's scary. It's a little scary for the child. Um, and so punishment often has that sense of fear, uh, a real sort of deep negative emotion that can actually drive the parent and child apart over time. So a lot of psychologists say you shouldn't use punishment too much. Um, it's dangerous. It may weaken your relationship with the child. Now let's think about that same situation, but in terms of response cost. For response cost, the idea would be, you know, I told you not to, to use those words um, at all, and so I'm sorry, but um, this week you're not you're not getting any television because you use those words. So you cannot watch television at all this week. So we're removing something positive. Now, first thing about that that fear thing isn't really there. In fact, it, it kind of transforms into something that sounds more like a negotiation, more like a legal agreement. Um, and it's, it's about the behavior and not so much about you. So it's not like you are a bad person, you are embarrassing me. It's like that thing you just did, that behavior is on our list of behaviors you're not supposed to do. Uh, and because you did that, now you lose this. Okay, very almost legalistic. And if in the future, if you stop doing that, you will stop losing this. So it becomes you know, much less fear, anger, and much more almost rational if then. You know, you did this, so that happens. That's the consequence of the behavior. And so the idea is there that you're almost having a communication with the child. You can say as a parent, you can, you can literally give these mixed messages. Listen, dear, I love you 100%. Um, you know, I'm so happy you're my child. Uh, I love being around you. But every now and then you do things that I don't love. So I love you, but I don't love that behavior. And so when you emit that behavior, there will be consequences. My love is not one of them. You're not going to lose that. But you are going to lose certain privileges that I give you. Okay? So that, that becomes a very much more cool interaction, less angry, less emotional. And therefore, it may not only shape, you know, even though these things both result in that behavior being less likely, they may do so in different ways, um, ways that affect the relationship in different ways. Okay, so all that meant to be an example of why we, we make these subtle distinctions um, that we do between these kinds of reinforcement. All right, and again, extinction at the end, Extinction is, is just the notion that if there's no discernible consequence for some action, nothing positive, nothing negative, then you tend to stop doing that as well. Um, because it's just, you know, why bother? Nothing results. All right. We got all those terms. Let's move on. All right. So I always like this. I, I like this because I'm, uh, we'll get to the end. The training the bio problem. I've actually already sort of introduce shaping to you, but I did it subtly and sneakily, so I'm going to bring it back now. You have all these reinforcers, these, these things you can do to make behaviors more or less likely. All of which, by the way, often are discuss, discussed under the term behavior modification. These are tools to allow us to modify the behavior of others. But often when we want to use them well, we have to employ a process that we call shaping. Um, especially if the behavior you want is a behavior that's not natural um, for that organism to, to, to perform. So if they wouldn't, you know, if they do perform it every now and then, well, you can just reward them when they perform it and you can make it more likely. But what if you want to teach something or someone to do something they wouldn't naturally do? That's sort of the power of operant conditioning, that you can do that, um, but then you tend to use shaping. So that is you're going to try to teach the organism to do this behavior in what we call successive approximations. So, yeah, let's go to the dolphin. Let's say what we really want is a dolphin to go jumping through a burning hoop. And as I mentioned to you before, this is not something dolphins generally just do. So you could hold a burning hoop over the water, and you could say, well, as soon as the dolphin goes through that burning hoop, I am going to reward that sucker. 
and you could be there three months later holding the burning hoop over the water because no dolphin is likely to just go, I'm bored, I'll jump through a burning hoop, okay? But here's how you actually make it happen. And, and listen sort of carefully as I do this. You try to think of the goal, jumping through a burning hoop, but then you try to think how can you get from where you start, dolphin swimming around, to that goal, and are there steps you could take? So for example, you might do the following. You might submerge the hoop in the water. Okay. Now, let me, let me back up a little bit um, so that we'll get back to that three-term contingency so you see the whole thing. First of all, we want to train the dolphin to do this. So we probably want um, some sort of discriminative stimulus, something to tell it what we want. Okay. And so we may have, um, let's say this is hoop. I just made this up. So we blow our little whistle, which tells the dolphin we want something. We do this. Now, at the beginning, it's like, what the heck is that? Um, but, we're, but we give it that symbol. And then maybe we put the hoop in the water. The dolphin's not going to know what to do. It's going to swim around. But there's a chance, if you got the hoop in the water, there's a chance the dolphin will swim through the hoop that's in the water. Right? That's pretty consistent with its sort of normal behavior. Um, if he does, if, if he isn't, let's even go a step further. So you try that, but he doesn't swim through the hoop. Well, then what you might do is watch him swim, but when he comes anywhere near the hoop, then you blow your whistle to tell him he's getting a reward. And he looks up at you, like, what? And you give him a fish. And then you go like this again. And he's like, hmm, okay. He swims around, but when he swims close to the hoop, you blow your whistle, you give him a fish, okay? Very quickly, he will start realizing, oh, the action's around this hoop. This is what's giving me the fish when I'm around there. But here's the trick. Then you bump up the task that he has to perform to get a reward. So now you still got your hoop in your water. You give him, you give him the sign, hoop in the water. He goes over near the hoop. That's not enough. He's a little annoyed. He's hanging around the hoop a little bit more, still not getting anything. Sooner or later, he'll go through the hoop. Then you blow your whistle. All right, um, cool, he comes, gets his fish. You give him that, you put your hoop in the water, um, he comes around the hoop, not enough, but when he goes through it again, you blow your whistle, you give him the fish. Excellent, okay, so very quickly he will learn. I go through that hoop, I get a fish. Oh, but that's not enough anymore. Now you start lifting the hoop, okay? Maybe it's only half out of the water, and now he has to kind of get up and out of the water and through, and if he does that, after you do this, then you give him a fish. Okay, if he goes under the hoop or, or doesn't come out of the water, not enough. Then of course you lift the hoop out of the water, and he has to jump up through the hoop. If he does that, you blow the whistle, you give him the reward, etc., etc., etc. So you keep moving towards the situation you want. Eventually you might like put a little bit of fire on the top of the hoop. If he jumps through it, you get the fish. Um, and then eventually you can get to the full-blown thing. So that's shaping. That gets you this behavior that isn't typically there. And let me give, I'll give you another example that I think you'll, you'll enjoy. Uh, I do like to point out just with an example like this, that when you learn something like karate, this is how they reward people. Uh, when you start, you're crappy at doing everything, right? But they show you some of the things that you're supposed to be able to do. Uh, you start learning them, you start working with them, and then they give you a test at some point. And if you're, if you're okay, if you can sort of do these things and sort of remember them, they might give you a yellow belt, right? But then after you've been there for a while, they expect you to get better. If you want to earn the next belt, you've got to be able to do those things, but you have to do them better than you had to for the yellow. Um, and if you do them better, then maybe you'll get an orange. And then if you want a green belt, well, you have to do them even better than you did for the orange. So slowly you're learning and shaping and getting these behaviors more and more in line with the ultimate goal state, which is to be able to kick somebody's butt, right? So things like karate or learning a new language. If someone learns a new language, we reward them early on when they're kind of okay, but then we want them to be better than just okay. okay? And so we up the reward. So here's something you can try. Most of you guys are probably in biology, an intro bio class. Um, so this is a, an example that I kind of think is funny. You can, if you wish, teach your bio prof to lecture to you, well, depending on how well you can do this, 
all the way to the far corner of the room. You can make them stand way over to the side of the room and lecture to you. And they might not even know you're doing it to them, that you're training them. How would you do that? Well, first of all, you have a very powerful reward you can offer them. Uh, that reward, every professor wants it. It's your attention. They want you to seem like you're attending to them and that you're interested in what they're saying. So you can use that. Here's what you do. So let's say the professor just wanders around randomly when they talk. If they wander over to this side of the room, you all put your heads down and look bored, like you're not paying attention. But if they wander over to this side of the room, then you all look up and you seem really interested in what they're saying. Okay? You will find very quickly, just like the dolphin, they will start hanging out in this side of the room. Okay? Very naturally. But, but what you have to do then is, well, hanging out on that side of the room isn't enough now. We want you over here. If you're just over here, we start looking bored. But if you go over here, then we pay attention. Okay, and you will very quickly get them over here. And if you keep doing this and keep doing this, you might be able to get them. I don't know if you can still hear me back here, but you might be able to get them to stand way at the back of the room and lecture because you gradually, through successive approximations, are changing the way you're rewarding them. Give it a try. See if it works. All right, let's roll along. But that's shaping, rewarding successive approximations to ultimately allow you to produce a behavior that ne may never have, have occurred before. All right. Oh, schedules of reinforcement. Okay, so there's a bunch of these little things related to operant conditioning you have to get. And, and, I, and I try to explain these to you in ways that will make sense a little bit. So this one, I like to talk about how to flirt uh, a little bit. Uh, we'll get back to the how to flirt but let me just first of all give you these terms. So what we're talking about now is something called schedules of reinforcement. And what that refers to is, well, how are you going to reward this, this organism? Okay, you want it to do something. Let's say you get it to a point where it is doing that sometimes. How, how are you going to synchronize your rewards with the behavior and what are, what are the results of doing it different ways. Okay, that all sounded really arbitrary, I know, but let's actually get into to some of these. A big difference, uh, I'm going to, we'll come back to interval. Let's just leave the interval aside and let's do this ratio thing, fixed ratio, variable ratio. Um, what we mean, first of all, why are we saying ratio? We're going to be talking about things like this. If we want the animal to do something, let's say a bar press, we want them to press a bar like the rats do, how many times does he have to press the bar before we give them a reward? So that's the ratio. How many bar presses per reward? And the interesting distinction we're, we're drawing here is you can have a fixed ratio or a variable ratio. And it turns out that there's some very interesting things that happen when you go variable. Let's start with fixed. A fixed reward would just be like the following. You could have a three to one fixed ratio reward system. And what that means is if the rat presses the bar three times, he gets a reward. And then he has to press it another three times and he gets a reward. But he always gets it after three times, okay? If you do that, if you use that sort of fixed ratio, then what you tend to see, this is a horrible graph as I'm looking at it. Um, but anyway. Uh, I'll try to give you a sense. You will see him do three things and then he'll just stop for a while. So here it says short pause after, reinforce, after reinforcement. So he basically does this. I mean, what this graph says is the rat will learn to do this. One, two, three. And then he'll use thing. Take a bit of a pause. All right, one, two, three. And then he'll eat his thing. So you get these what are sometimes called response bursts. You get a little burst of responding and then a plateau of non-responding, okay? And a burst and a plateau and a burst and a plateau. Now, here's the kind of interesting thing. If instead, if instead you make it a little more random, so what we're gonna do now is we're, we're going to say, we'll use three to one, but it'll be three plus or minus two, okay? And what I mean by that is sometimes if the rat presses the bar just once, he'll get a reward, okay? On average, it'll take him three presses, but sometimes it'll only take one, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes five, okay? 
Okay, so that's three plus or minus two, right? Anywhere from one to five. Uh, so now the rat isn't quite sure when the reward is coming. It's different from that one, two, three, here comes a reward, one, two, three, here comes a reward. Because sometimes it's like one, two, three, I get a reward, one, oh, I got a reward. One, two, three, four, where's my reward? Five, oh, there's my reward. One, two, so it never really knows when the reward is coming. There's this randomness to when it is reinforced. And when that happens, when you do it that way, you get rid of these little plateaus, okay? You get rid of those little pauses. Instead, you get a very steady rate of responding, okay? The, the, the rat gets much more um, in tune, so to speak, and much more constant. Why do I call this how to flare? Okay, so let me make this distinction again, but give you a, an example you might find a little more interesting. Let's say there is somebody on campus that you think is interested in you and you think you might be interested in them. And you run into them every now and then. You, you know, you pass in the hallway. You don't know them well enough to talk to them yet. But they, f they smile at you when they see you. So now, the question is, what do you do? You can reward them for smiling at you. How do you reward them for smiling at you? Well, you smile back, right? That sort of says, yeah. <laughs> Say no more. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So, um, Fixed ratio or variable ratio. Let's get all Skinner on this. So let's say you decide, okay, what I'm going to do is that person's going to have to smile at me three times. And I, at the first two, I'm not going to smile back. The third one, I'll smile back. Okay. Um, but then again, when I run into them twice, they'll see me, I won't smile. Third time, I'll smile. And I'll use this fixed ratio. What you will tend to see is you may actually see them at some point, smile, smile, smile. And if, if you smile back, they're gonna be smiling at you a lot, but they're gonna smile at you in little bursts. They're gonna to try to get their three smiles in until you smile back, and then they'll feel, okay, whew, okay, cool. But if you really wanna get them interested, you use a variable ratio. So sometimes you smile back the first time they smile at you. Sometimes you play a little hard to get, and they smile at you, and you don't smile back. They smile at you, you don't smile back. They smile at you, you don't smile back. They smile at you, and you smile back. If you use this variable ratio, you will get them more interested. They will be more interested in smiling at you. The rate of smiling will go up, and the steadiness will go up. Okay. So if you really want to, to get their interest, um, that's how you do it. Now... <laughs> There's a negative side. I guess it's a negative side. It depends on the situation. The negative side is when you use a variable ratio, this behavior also becomes less susceptible to extinction. So remember, extinction was when there's no reward or punishment, the behavior usually goes away. So the idea here would be, all right, you got, mis you got this person smiling at you all the time. You got them hooked. But you meet somebody else like this other person and you're now in a relationship and now this person's smiling at you all the time that's kind of annoying that's not good that's getting in the way so you wish they would stop smiling at you and so you just decide well I'm not gonna smile back okay I'm not gonna reward this smiling behavior that's good now if you had used a fixed ratio if you had smiled back every three times this person is very gonna quickly realize the game has changed right because they'll smile at you three times and you're not smiling back and you're like, all right. I see you again. They smile at you three times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't smile back. Very soon they'll realize she ain't smiling back. Something's different. However, if you use the variable ratio, sometimes you didn't smile back until they did it five times. Sometimes you smile back right away. But you left the person guessing. Is she going to smile back or is she not going to smile back? I've just made you a female, by the way. Um, now the problem is, if you decide, I'm not going to smile back, that person can think, oh, she's going to smile back. I just got to keep smiling. If I keep smiling long enough, eventually she'll smile back because that's how it's worked in the past. So variable ratios tend to hook people a lot more. Uh, and this is why, by the way, they're used for slot machines. If you think of slot machines and those gambling things, those are variable ratios. You put in um, the coin, uh, you, every slot machine will pay off at some point but you don't know when. 
Uh, and so what you see, by the way, is, is people, when they start playing a machine for a while, they keep waiting for it to pay off. It's got to pay off at some point. It's got to pay off at some point. And if they've been at a machine for a long time and it hasn't paid off, the longer it goes without paying off, the more they expect it's just about to. And there have been situations where people have been in gambling establishments and have li literally peed their pants sitting in front of a machine because they can't imagine walking to the washroom and having somebody else sit in their machine, put in a coin, and win their money. Right? So they have to stay there. That's the thing with variable ratios. It's addictive. So, you know, if you want to use variable ratios in your flirting behavior, go ahead. It'll, it'll make you a more powerful flirter. But if you ever suddenly decide that person you were flirting with you're not interested in anymore, you could be in trouble with variable ratio. They might still keep thinking, oh, no, no, you're interested. You're just not showing me. You will. All right. Cool. Let's jump down to, to fixed interval, variable interval. I'm not going to talk about this too much other than to say um, you can have the same discussion we just kind of had, but instead of talking about you know how many times does it have to press the bar or how many times does somebody have to smile, that's what we think in the ratio terms, you actually talk about um, whether they are pressing the bar or whether they are smiling after some certain interval has elapsed. So it's more time-based fixed interval versus random interval. So let me just give you, people like to talk about intervals because sometimes it seems to relate more to the real world in some ways. So give you two examples. Let's say you work in one of these places where there's a bunch of people working in cubicles or something like that and then there's a boss somewhere. And the boss every now and then comes out to make sure everybody's working hard, right? So. A boss can do this in one of two ways. Here's the dumb boss. The dumb boss uses a fixed interval. So basically, imagine that every hour on the hour, they go out and look at people. And if people are working hard, they say, good job, you're working hard. So they reward you as long as you're working when they come out. Okay? And they come out every hour. So what's going to happen in that situation? Well, this is what this kind of depicts. What will happen is, uh, where, where do we want to start? Let's start here. So this is right after the boss came out one time. So the boss came out, looked around, everybody was doing stuff. And then he goes into his office. What happens? Well, everybody starts reading Facebook or doing whatever. It's like, boss is gone. We can screw off now. So they stop working. They do whatever and they do whatever and do whatever until just before the hour. And they know the boss is going to be out just before the hour. So suddenly they all start working just before he comes out. So what you see is you know, a lot of responding until he comes out, then he comes out, and then they goof off. And then they respond a little till he comes out, so that when he does come out, they're responding, but then they goof off. And they respond a little, and then they goof off. And they respond a little, and then they goof off. So we sometimes call this the scalloped kind of effect. Um, and, you know, that's, if you can predict, when do I have to look busy? If I know that, well, then I'll just look busy at that time, and I don't have to the rest of the time. If your boss is smarter, they will use a variable interval. So instead of coming out every hour, they will come out every half hour plus or minus 20 minutes. So what that means is, it might be the case that they come out and, and 10 minutes later they're out again, already looking around. Or sometimes it may take an hour and a half before they come out again. But again, you never know. You're not sure when your boss is going to come out. So if you're not sure, and if you know, well, if they do come out and I'm working, they're gonna they're gonna like that. That's gonna be good. Then I better just be working all the time, right? So because I don't know when they're gonna come out, so I have to be working all the time. And that's what you kind of see when you use a variable interval. That um, you see sort of slow, steady responding, um, where this person just is working all the time because they never know when the boss is gonna be over their shoulder. So you don't see this sort of scalloped kind of thing. Okay. All of this, you know, hopefully I, I, I know it's kind of dry, the schedules of reinforcement stuff, but just to give you a sense, these are the kinds of things that behaviorists played with. You know, all they had was the stimuli, the behavior, and how they reinforce stuff. So they played with all of these different ways of reinforcing and different schedules of reinforcing to try to see how that would change learning, how that would change behavior. And that's another example of that. Your textbook will go into that too. Hopefully I've helped you get through that a little bit. All right. So you can think of when you start thinking of schedules of reinforcement, 
Now you can look at things in everyday life and kind of map on what people are doing. So this is just a quick little kind of quiz to get you thinking about this stuff to see if you got it. But the question is, let's, let's look at these events. So getting a paycheck every other week. So assuming the paycheck is like a reward, if you get one every two weeks, what kind of schedule of reinforcement is that? Well, that would be a fixed interval, right? Every two weeks, as long as you're still working, as long as you're still at the job, you get a paycheck. Um, and so it's based on time and it's interval. It's not based on number of responses, it's based on time. And it's fixed because it's not like, sometimes you get it after only a week, sometimes it's three weeks. So with this case, you know, every two weeks, you're gonna get a paycheck, fixed interval. Um, yeah, you can go through all of these, but, but let's, let's, let's do like six is variable ratio. Let's look at six. Fly fishing, casting and reeling back several times before you catch a fish fish how barbaric anyway so if somebody is fishing they don't know it's variable because they don't know how many casts they have to do and because we're talking about the number of casts you know that's how it's how it's written here that's what makes it a ratio problem if we're talking about how long they have to fish it would sound like an interval problem but it's the number of casts so how many times do you have to cast before you get a fish um, and every now and then you will, and you'll be rewarded, but it's not a fixed number of casts. It's not like every 10 times you cast, you get a fish. It may be 10 plus or minus, you know, nine. Might be, you might get a fish two casts in a row, and it may take a lot of time between, etc. So try out some of these. Um, if they all make sense to you, and you get the right answers, you got it, all right? Cool. Um, I've already highlighted this a little bit to you, but let me highlight it again. When you have what's called an intermittent reinforcement schedule or a variable reinforcement schedule, those var variable ones we were talking about, they are very resistant to extinction. In fact, when we say people can become addicted to gambling, we use a term like addicted, which sounds like a biological process, like being addicted to a drug, but it's a psychological addiction, we call it. Well, you know what we actually mean by that is that this person is engaging in a behavior um, and they can't seem to stop engaging in that behavior. And often that's because of the way they were rewarded for doing that behavior in the past. And almost always they were re rewarded in a sort of random way. So they would engage in some behavior and every now and then it would turn out really good. Uh, and so even if it didn't, most of the rest of the time, like if you think of gambling, you know, most of the times you pull that thing, you've just lost a dollar, assuming it's a dollar machine. Put in another dollar, you lose it. You put in another dollar, you lose it. So you're losing, 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 winning. Losing, 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 losing. So you do all this losing, but occasionally there's winning in there. And because there's occasionally winning, that can get you addicted, especially when you don't know when the winning's going to happen. Um, so it's very resistant to extinction. People keep doing these behaviors, uh, even though on average they're they're negative. But there's this notion that, yeah, but I could win the big one and that'll be great. Okay, so yeah, the higher the ratio of reinforcement, the higher the resistance. So like if when with the flirting, I said three plus or minus two, right? So in that case, if someone smiles at you 20 times and you don't smile back, they're probably gonna bail, all right? But if you, you know, said, if you instead had a 20 plus or minus five variable ratio, um, so that they always had to do at least 15, to get a smile out of you. And sometimes they had to do um, you know, 25 or 30 to get a smile out of you. The higher that ratio, the more likely they are to, to kind of keep at it. And of course, with slot machines and gambling, often it is, you have to do a lot of playing before you win. Uh, and you never know when you're going to win. So that sort of, um, that sort of schedule of reinforcement can, can support psychological addictions. That's why people, you know, when we talk about should we have gambling in the city of Toronto, let's say, people worry that, yeah, but for some people they could become addicted and they could lose all their money and lose their house and their wealth um, just so other people can have a little bit of entertainment. Is that, or, you know, what, what's often brought on the table as well, but it employs so many people. There's so much, there's so much employment to be had. So what if a few people get addicted? There's a lot of benefits. Um, I think that's all I got. So I'm going to leave that with you.
to think about. Read through the stuff on uh, in your textbook. Hopefully that all helps. And yes, this will count as both the Friday and the Monday lecture. So I will see you guys again Wednesday next week. All right? Later. Have a good one.